now, just for your info. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to Frankfurt and Tel Aviv and London and Berlin, Mary. And um, to our next session of our wonderful series, Context, Contrast and Continuity, our partner program with the White City Center in Tel Aviv and uh, with the Ernst May Gesellschaft here in Frankfurt. Um, welcome um, here at the Deutsche Architekturmuseum. Some of you who followed maybe the last few sessions know the background. I'm sitting in the exhibition Greening the City which has actual real life plants, indoor plants, and it's a very, very pleasant atmosphere. It's raining outside, but we're nice and dry and in a green area. And I welcome everybody to our sixth session of our series. And tonight we will discuss the role of human architects in modernism and today, a topic which will not become unpopular anytime soon, I would assume but rather continue our discussions. Uh, I think um, some of you maybe have seen already uh, the exhibition Frau Architekt, Mary Pepczynski, who will join us today, will, um, was one of the curators or the main curator who started this entire project. And we, uh, that exhibition is traveling, but um, currently it is in Izmir with the Goethe Institute. It will also be in Berlin early June in parts and bits and pieces. So uh, we are part of a bigger discussion tonight. And I really look forward to our discussion. Um, and tonight our moderator will be Sharon Golan Yaron. She is the program director of the Max Liebling House and will join us pretty soon, I would assume. So I will keep continue talking. My name is Andrea Jürges. I'm the deputy director of uh, the uh, Deutsches Architekturmuseum, the German Architecture Museum in Frankfurt. And um, the entire series has been made possible thanks to uh, the financial funding of the uh, federal uh, ministry uh, who has the federal sponsoring program Nationale Projekte des Städtebaus and we are talking doing this series because we're discussion we are discussing um, comparing Tel Aviv with Frankfurt because Tel Aviv has the white city center built in the 19 the white city built in the 1940s I assume and then we have here in Frankfurt the noise Frankfurt the big housing estates of Ernst May from the 1920s to 30s. And that is one of the uh, big discussions we are exploring in more detail in different topics since November last year. And I have to say all of our discussions so far have been really interesting. And I look forward to today's discussion. I will shortly introduce you the speakers of today, as you can see them on the screen. We have, first of all, Mary Pepczynski, as I just said, co-curator of Frau Architekt, and she was until very recently a uh, professor for architecture in Dresden. Then we have Sigal Davidi from Tel Aviv. I hope I do that correct. And she's an architect and architecture historian. And Mary Pepczynski and Sigal Davidi already worked together before. And we have Mavi Massa, she's an architect from Pakistan, currently in London. And she will tell us more about her view and her experiences. And we have also as our expert critic, Karin Hartmann. Um, she is an architect and author currently, um, currently uh, uh, writing a book about women architects. And we are also, what you see on the screen, is one of our very lively uh, discussion participants. That's Inbal Ben Asher Gitler. She was already moderator of one evening and presenting at, an, at another, and will do so at another event. And I will have to excuse myself in a minute because uh, Sharon apparently can't uh, come in. And so I have to 
Uh, can she, can, wait, wait a minute. Um, Okay, there should be Sharon coming in now. Hello. Uh -huh. Ah, wonderful. Thank you, Sharon. Oh, thank sorry. You. Sorry, I didn't see that. Technical problems, no problem. So thank you, Andrea, for introducing. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here with you again, Andrea, and the Dam in Frankfurt, and also with Ikomos, with Iran, and Inbal from, uh, from Israel, and uh, with our... Uh, amazing speakers of today. So uh, you have introduced everybody already. So uh, you Sorry, I just uh, had to do something. Oh, that's great. I'm very happy for that. Um, yeah, so um, just, you know, as an introduction to the subject, I think um, in this bilateral dialogue between Germany and Israel, this subject uh, has actually a very important role because as you stated, uh, both Tel Aviv and Frankfurt have um, zones or built heritage of um, modernism. And um, as the 50 migration wave was the one who actually um, sort of built up this modern movement um, style buildings in Tel Aviv, um, they were mainly from German speaking countries. And with this immigration wave, also a lot of female architects uh, came to mandatory Palestine back then. And it's very uh, interesting to see how, um, how much feminine impact there is uh, on the local architecture. I'm not the expert, we have Sigal to do that, but I always feel very proud sort of as an architect and an architectural historian um, in Israel to sort of speak about the feminine role um, of building up Tel Aviv um, as a, a white city already in the 30s. Um, so if we speak about the role of female architect uh, today, we still see that the subject is predominantly um, dominated by, uh, by males, no, in the profession itself. Uh, whereas um, maybe in architecture schools, also here in the country, um, there is more than 50% uh, female architects. So uh, I think this discussion um, should uh, also not only look towards uh, the role of the female architects in the 30s, but also see where it finds us today, also in terms of um, the broader social impact um, of the understanding of the role of a female uh, in, in jobs um, uh, in, in professions, uh, also in other uh, subjects. I think it's very, very relevant. And um, also, I would like to perhaps uh, state for the people who joined uh, us and are not so uh, into the field that um, at the Bauhaus School no, in uh, Germany, there was a, a manifest which stated that any person of a good rapture, uh, without regards to age or sex, could be admitted at the Bauhaus School. But um, in the end of the day, uh, the female students were urged to uh, or encouraged to do um, weaving um, or pottery um, and uh, not so much professions of architecture. So there were no actually women who really studied architecture. And uh, Walter Grupius, uh, the founder and the first um, principal of the school, actually said one time that um, he thinks that um, men think in three dimensions, whereas women <coughs> handle two dimensions. So I think these are statements that sort of give us the background of um, this sort of uh, problem, I would even call it, that we face today in the profession of architecture and the role that female architects play in it. Uh, but without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mary Putinsky, who was the co-creator of Frau Architect, to give us an overview 
um, of her research um, on this topic. And afterwards, uh, we can continue our discussion uh, with the audience. So please, if you have questions, state them here uh, in the chat um, and we will come to uh, questions and answers after all our speakers uh, have spoken. Uh, but please still feel free to comment. And if you have anything interesting to say, all speakers, I really want to encourage sort of a dialogue here because this topic I think um, is, uh, is so relevant and I'm sure it also raises a lot of emotions. So let's keep it very, you know, fluid and feminine, even if uh, it's not uh, very conventional, but also in how we do it today. So please, Mary. Mr. Sherman, thank you very much for the introduction and also Andrea, thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation to speak. I'm very, looking, very much looking forward to, to this discussion later today. Andrea, the first slides. Yes, let me, let me share your, okay. my screen. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. There we go. And although I'm going to focus on women architects in the 20s and 30s and the situation in Germany, I think what I'll be talking about has a lot of relevance for really the discussion today. The next slide. Frau Architect, we just heard about it, took place between September 2017 and March 2018 at DAM, the German Architecture Museum in Frankfurt am Main. It included an exhibition of 22 women architects who were active between 1900 and today, in addition to films, a catalog, and public events. We explored how issues such as class, family situation, religion, and political affiliation intersected with the desire of women to become architects. Next. Our theme today is the woman architect in the 1920s and the 1930s, but in Germany, women architects such as Fia Villa, Amelia Winkelmann, and Therese Mugger, already practicing in Germany around 1900. They were wealthy women who built mostly domestic architecture for their family, for women clients. Next. Yet like all women architects in the 20th century, they had to construct a private life that would accommodate their unusual desire to practice architecture. Winkelmann was a lesbian who lived with women and was very close to her large birth family. Mugger, a divorcee, had three children and she sent them to boarding school so she could study and work. And Villa, she was a mother, she practiced with her husband but she also made and published photographs of herself with her daughter to show that maternity and professional work were compatible. Nonetheless, like all women in the 1920s and the 1930s, they had to negotiate three main challenges to reach their professional goals. Next. First, women had to counter misogynist attitudes towards feminine ability. For example, that women were not creative, that they had bad taste, they were unable to think in three dimensions, did not understand technology, would become men if they worked in masculine professions like architecture, or could only strive to assist men in an architectural office and weren't able to direct one themselves and on and on and on. Next. Second, they had to get an education and training. In Germany, a university education was only necessary to become an architect after 1950. Women were admitted to all German technical universities after 1909 and some women architects study applied arts or fine arts. The costs were high, and after 1920, places for women were restricted at many schools for the, for the returning soldiers. 
or simply due to enduring prejudice against women, as was the case at the Dessau Bauhaus, as we see here. And um, the architecture course was formally introduced at the Dessau Bauhaus in 1927 by Hannes Meyer. And we see here the first woman architecture student, Lotte Stambeza, and next to her is the third woman to study architecture at the Bauhaus, and that is Vera Meyer Waldeck. And they actually both went on to have very interesting careers. Next. Third, women had to struggle to find clients or get a job. There was, great there was great prejudice against their ability. And this was not easy considering the attitudes towards women at that time or the novelty of women architects. And well into the 1950s, one finds advertisements like this in architecture magazines from very well qualified women who are looking for work in this case, someone is looking for a, a position in an office. Next. During the 1920s and 1930s, approximately 5% of all architects, that was slightly under 300 people in Germany, were women. Those with their own practice, like the Princess Victoria Zibentheim in Steinfurt, ran small offices in regional cities and built domestic architecture. For the most part, they embraced the kind of architecture called new tradition, which based new architecture on regional forms and local methods of construction and was taught at many leading universities in Germany well into the 1940s. Next. The First World War, however, resulted in an excess of 2 million more adult women than adult men. These women, overwhelmingly young, flocked to cities in search of work. The image of the carefree, independent new woman who was an architect was linked to the modern architecture appearing in urban areas at this time. In reality, her everyday life was extremely challenging as women earned less than men and adequate housing for singles was difficult to find. And of course, prejudice against professional women endured. Next. Therefore, many women architects worked in, in collaboration with or for a, a male architect, such as Lily Reich, and her exhibitions with Mies van der Rohe are very well known, or Marlena Moschke-Polzig, and many interiors or houses that are known or are associated with Hans Polzig were actually, were actually designed by Marlena. Although each collaboration had its own dynamic, it could prove stressful, as clients were unnerved by the presence of a dominant influential woman, as was the case of Lily Reich, or the office and the staff sometimes resented the direction of women, as was the situation with Marlena Moschka-Polzig, who was also the mother of three children with Hans Polzig. Next. Other women, the next slide. Andrea, the next slide. So until we wait for the next slide. Uh, I have sure. to I have to stop and do it again. I'll be okay. Let me do this again. So, okay. Anyway, let me just, just say that collaboration was one form that um, you do find people working in collaboration with one another that would happen in different ways, but it doesn't always mean that it happened in a harmonious way, that it, there could also be many, many conflicts. And that's something that one has to realize as well. Um, probably it's much less so today, but at the time when one reads about what happened at this time, um, there was very often a lot of conflicts that would come about as well. So when we see the women that you showed now, usually yeah. they were in collaboration, doing their work in collaboration with um, their men or like with their husbands, or was it like um, also women who had their own practices? That's a good question. Um, in the case of Lily Reich and Marlena Moschke-Polzig, it's very interesting because Lily Reich always had her own office and she always did her own work, but she also chose to do projects with Mies van der Rohe. And they, they, um, 
it was very transactional. Uh, she was in love with him. Uh, he was he had been in love with her, but less so. Um, they worked. They very consciously worked together. I mean, he really realized how important she was, and he always consulted with her. Even when he was in America, he would send stuff to her for her to comment on. At the same time, she took a lot. He was lazy, and she took up a lot of bureaucratic work for him that he just didn't want to do. And she very consciously works with him because she's able to work on these very big projects like the World Exhibition in Barcelona, the German presentation that as a well-known and accepted designer, she couldn't have done it alone. And in the case of Mushka Poltzig, it's very interesting because she was actually, a, she was very young, but she was very well known as a sculptor. And she got commissions to make like little sculptures that would then be mass produced and everything. And she was on her way to becoming an independent artist in her own right. But she realized how difficult that was going to be as a woman. And she was involved with Hans Poltzig and she then decides then to work with him as opposed to go out on her own. But there, in answer to what you're saying, there's also all sorts of combinations, women who are involved with someone or someone who's just working with someone, they're not involved, but they're collaborating as well. As we do more research, we find uh, many different stories that start coming out. So, yeah, there we are, wonderful. So um, the next thing was, um, so another way that women, what women do to, uh, to establish themselves, we find that a lot of women are very mobile. Uh, sometimes they choose to be mobile, relocate from one place to another. Sometimes it's disruption because of political or economic reasons. For example, Marie Fromer, who was one of the first women to study at the Technical University in Berlin, and then uh, before the First World War, she works in different places in Germany. She has an office in Berlin, and then she reloads to, relocates to New York in 1940 and continues to work there. And we're going to hear probably about Lotta Cohen shortly, but she was Marie Fromer's good friend from their days at the University of Berlin. Lotta Cohen works in East Prussia, which is today in Eastern Poland. And then uh, she was a Zionist and she, grew, she then uh, relocates to the mandatory Palestine in the 1920s. The next. Yeah. In the 1920s, the city of Frankfurt Main was home to two prominent new women architects, Lucy Hillebrand and Margareta Schutteli-Hudski. Both had long careers in architecture, yet they built almost exclusively for the domestic sphere or projects serving children and youth, a very gendered dimension of professional practice. Next. Lucy Hillebrand studied at art schools in Offenbach and Cologne and established an atelier in Frankfurt in the 1920s. Next. Her mother was Jewish and her father was Catholic. She suffered great personal tragedy during the Second World War. And her first post-war project was a memorial, which was unbuilt to the war and its suffering that we see here. Next. She then moved with her daughter and her second husband to the small university city of Göttingen, where she realized residential art, uh, architecture and social welfare projects throughout Northwest Germany. Next. She was fascinated by the movement of the body through buildings and design circulation to celebrate physical activity in architecture. Next, Hillebrand practiced well into the 1980s. She was a feminist, a social activist, and a public intellectual. She also made films about architecture and is one of only three women out of approximately 70 architects whose papers are kept in the damn archive today. Next, yet Lucy Hillebrand was atypical. In the 1920s and the 1930s, educated women preferred to work in a public building department in Germany because the pay was good, the hours were regulated, and there was less discrimination. This was the situation of Margarete Lihotsky from Vienna, the first woman to study architecture at the Royal School of Applied Arts there. In 1926, she joined the staff of Ernst Mai's New Frankfurt Project, part of the vast modernization of the city. Responsible for housing and social welfare projects, she is known for designing the first built-in kitchen, known as the Frankfurt Kitchen, 
intended to reduce a woman's housework and installed in over 30,000 new housing units in that city. Yet Chetelihatsky also encountered discrimination. Women were not allowed to work as employees in public bureaucracies if they married. Once married to her colleague, the architect Wilhelm Schütte, now Margareta Schütte Lihatsky, continued to work there, but on a freelance basis. Next. A, com a committed communist, starting in 1930, both Margareta and Wilhelm spent five years working for Ernst May in the Soviet Union on modernization projects, focusing on childcare and educational infrastructure. Next. In the the late 1930s found them in Turkey, where they undertook similar work. Next, a politically engaged architect, she carried out resistance work in the 1940s in Vienna. She was arrested, sent to prison in Bavaria. And we see here sketches that she made uh, about her prison cell and later a book that she wrote about her imprisonment, which is now being translated into English. Next. In the post-war years, Margarete schütte hutsky remained in Vienna. She worked independently and with Wilhelm Schütte. They eventually divorced and was an outspoken social activist. Next, due to her unrepentant communist ideology, it became difficult for her to find work in conservative Austria, yet she was engaged from time to time in East Germany and in Cuba. Next, although she worked as an architect, around the world. She is celebrated in museums like the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, or on this recent Austrian stamp for her most gender specific project, the Frankfurt Kitchen, which ironically for this ultimate new woman, plays homage to the traditional woman and her role in the nuclear family. Next. In Frankfurt Main, the home of Dam, she endures in the public imagination as a courageous, socially engaged new woman who, like many women architects of the 1920s and 1930s, defied prejudice, was mobile and politically active, and invented a private life to support her desire for a career in architecture. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That was very, very interesting. Um, of course, Margareta Szczytowiczki plays a role uh, in the architecture of Mandatory Palestine as well as, you know, with the, the influence of um, the international style and the modern movement. Also, this idea of how to create a kitchen uh, was uh, brought here to Mandatory Palestine, of course, with its adaptation to climatic and cultural conditions. But uh, all of this you can see here, maybe, if uh, the project that we're planning together with uh, the city of Frankfurt and with the Deutsches Architektur Museum uh, will happen, because we want to actually bring a Frankfurt kitchen from the Ernst May um, estate to uh, the Liebling House in Tel Aviv, where we have a floor plan, uh, which is kind of similar to the ideas of the Frankfurt kitchen. But this is a whole different story, and I hope we will uh, have a chance to discuss that as well. I would like to invite uh, Sigal Davidi, our local expert um, on feminine uh, architecture, uh, who has a lot, a lot to say about the role of uh, the feminine architects here. So please, Sigal. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I will share my screen. Sharon? Yes, we can see you very well and your screen as well. Sigal, are you uh, on it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. okay. No, it just stopped for a minute. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. But I have to share again. Okay. Oh, 
Okay. Kafegelina is considered an outstanding example of modernist European architecture in Free State Israel and a milestone in the development of local modern architecture. It was designed by three architects, Jenny Averbuch and her professional partner and spouse, Shaag, Shlomo Ginsburg, in cooperation with Elze Gidoni Mandelstam. Averbuch became famous after designing the Tina Dizengoff Square in Tel Aviv, one of the city's central landmarks and a symbol of its modernism. Gidoni Mandelstam was forgotten. I discovered her impressive body of work through data collection efforts in local and international archives in collaboration with women scholars around the world. And thank you, Mary, for your help. It, it is comprised of residential and public buildings, all except one in Tel Aviv. Gidoni moved to the United States in 1938 and worked for the architectural firm Kahn and Jacob in New York City. Some buildings in Manhattan carry her name as the planner. According to architectural historian Despina Stratikagos, Gidoni and other women architects who had immigrated from Europe played an important role in this dissemination the European modern architecture in the United States in the 30s and 40s. Uncovering the works of women whose creations and activities have been ignored, marginalized, and excluded from historiography stands at the focus of the feminist critical method. This method firmly contends that these neglected and forgotten works can be salvaged by oriented research, which has come to be known as rereading, uncovering, and her story instead of his story. This oriented journey led me to many other women architects, architects who worked in Eretz Israel in the 30s and were the first generation of local women architects. These women architects played an important part in introducing and advancing modern architecture in the new homeland, enhancing this way the social and cultural fabric of the nascent Jewish community. They planned public buildings, including new social institutions, as you can see in this slide, urban villas, apartment buildings, and residential neighborhoods. These women architects were never regarded collectively as one professional or social group. However, my research reveals that they had much in common. Not only they come from similar European backgrounds, most of them studied in Germany and Vienna, but also the private and professional lives in the new homeland were very much alike. This bland shared properties made them a singular phenomenon. One of the most prominent architects in Palestine was Lotte Cohen, who was a pioneer in her personal life, her work, and her writings. In 1916, she was the third woman to graduate the architecture department of the Technical University in Berlin. She immigrated from Berlin to Palestine in 1921 and became the first woman architect in Eretz Israel. Cohen spent her first decade in her new motherland in Jerusalem where she worked at the Palestine Land Development Company alongside the well-known architect and town planner, Richard Kaufmann. For decades, these projects were accredited uh, to Kaufmann only. Recent research by Ines Zonder and others reveals that the plans carry the signatures of both of them. At the same time, she also worked independently and planned pioneering projects for the Jewish issue such as the first agricultural school for women in Halal and the first children's home ever planned in a kibbutz. In 1931, she moved to Tel Aviv and opened her own architectural firm with engineer Joseph Marer, who had just arrived from Vienna. Over the British mandate era, she planned groundbreaking modernist projects in Tel Aviv. They included the first workers' restaurant equipped with, with electric electric appliances, a healthcare center for mothers, babies, and pregnant women in Kerimate Manim neighborhood, the modern Ketedan Hotel by the sea, an office building, and a large residential neighborhood in northern Tel Aviv, which comprised apartment houses, private houses, and commercial areas. Cohen played a significant part in making Tel Aviv a token of modern architecture. 
She was the only woman architect who publicly expressed her opinions, particularly on domestic planning and kitchen design from a woman's perspective. She wrote articles for architectural journals, women magazines, and daily newspapers. In planning and designing apartment buildings, women architects worked side by side with their male counterparts and colleagues and significantly contributed to adjust the modernist architectural vocabulary to the local conditions. For example, in order to adjust the typical horizontal windows of European modernism to the local climate, long balconies were introduced with built-in shading elements. Among the cities and villages of Israel, Tel Aviv is the most aware of the need of conservation and the one who have drawn comprehensive con conserv conservation plans. Many apartment buildings planned by women architects are situated in Tel Aviv's white city area, which was designated a UNESCO World Her Cultural Heritage Site in 2003. In buildings that are not uh, earmarked to, for street conservation, it is possible to build an additional floor. Such an additional floor can be either identical to the ones below or be, or be built a few meters away from the front facade, subject to be instructions, instructions of such street uh, conservation plan. I would like to end my short presentation again with Gidoni's projects in Tel Aviv, which, which still remain standing, but time has left its marks of them. Most of them have lost all signs of their glorious past and are not even listed for preservation. All of the buildings she planned in Tel Aviv in the 30s, uh, from, of all the buildings she planned in, the, in Tel Aviv in the, in, the, in the 30s, six still existed until the last summer. An apartment building on Ben Gurion Boulevard was recently demolished in order to build a new larger building. Another one on Jabotinsky Street is in great danger to have a similar fate. Its apartment owners are promoting a plan to replace, replace it by a new building. It is important to include these neglected and forgotten works into the canon and historiography of modern architecture in Israel. It is also very important to collaborate, exchange knowledge and ideas between scholars in the academia and the Tel Aviv municipality for preserving women architects' superb work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sigal. Um, I have to tell you the story that uh, I just uh, WhatsApp Sigal a photo of a building that I saw of one of the female architects you just showed, um, Jenny Avalbuch, who was just demolished without, I think, anybody taking notice of it. It happened so fast, and we really uh, have to understand. Um, if there is another method we can use in order to commemorate or to, co to perhaps um, preserve the sort of heritage, which can maybe not only be in a physical manner, um, but about conservation and about how to approach a conservation uh, of uh, the physical manifestations of these buildings, I would like to ask uh, Malvi to join us and, and tell us about her work. Um, and afterwards, we can um, hear um, Karin um, um, and her reflection of what we heard. So please, Marvin. Thank you so much, Sharon. I'll just share my screen. Does that work? Yes. Okay. So, it's an absolute pleasure to speak and connect on a very special topic, the role of female architects in modernism and today. If I start conversation on today, it will be very difficult. I must recognize a carved path from yesterday, which was developed into a thread. My entry point to this brief encounter is through two slides dedicated to archives, which will lead into a dialogue of fractured societies. I'll show a brief project of mine which become an in-between space to witness development. But before that, it's important to speak about a very important foundation, which is molded by two prominent female architects of Karachi, who played a huge role in developing my thinking process. And my last section is based on the contemporaries, women who are not practicing professional 
as professional architects, but are architects of place making. And they are questioning as social thinkers of what a public space in built environment means. They are the everyday architects. Carving space for four profession. Journey, Yasmin Lari, who heads Heritage Foundation. In one of her Guardian articles, the barefoot architect says, I was star architect for 36 years. Now I'm atoning. Yasmin Lari, Pakistan's first female architect, Jane Roo Prize winner, from a modernist path carver to a radical thinker, her mold is very important frame for all the thinkers of different disciplines, citizens, rural, urban set settings. For me, working with her, working for her. I feel she was ahead of her time. She's a constant experimenter. At 70, hasn't stopped experimenting with designs, materials, and ways of interventions. It's important to state here that most of her work is never a project. It's a master plan of social, anthropological, economic empowerment. Her work will be analyzed as a module in South Asian development. Carving space for others, Parveen Rahman. Uh, sorry, there's an urban resource center that's Orangi pilot project. A Dhaka born architect practicing in Karachi, practiced in Karachi, gone too soon. She worked in an environment where most people avoided to work. She developed and designed the basic principle of living, sanitation. She designed a network for laying infrastructure, but that needed documentation. Her mapping politics exercise threatened the land grabber, mafia. She was ardent compiler of the record of, pre of precious lands, which were fast converting from rural to urban. She involved communities in development work and her cautious endeavor was to empower people and lessen their sense of deprivation. Her work was way forward of her times. She was the architect for less, but unfortunately shot at a very unfortunate incident. I'm going to be talking about a personal activism of an intervention through a video in a rehabilitation project. But before I start the video, I would like to um, introduce a fractured society. Karachi being a hybrid of multiple religions, sects, and economic divisions with increasing stratification, it has constantly restricted the emergence of social sciences, art, literature, and cultural activities to a certain, to a certain spatial demographics of the city. As the city expands horizontally, the wealth is concentrated in certain parts, eroding from others. Here, it's important to question the context, contrast, and the continuity in South Asian cities, where limited resources are public projects, creating socially responsible experience outside our proposed projects. Fractured, fastest growing urban cities like Karachi, in the midst of chaos, is a home. A city powered by men taking space in majority, when do we start taking noticing the height of the entry and exit step of the public bus used by all genders in age brackets? When do we talk about grassroots change and bring activism within our design practice? When does parallel non-governmental small scale projects working in lesser communities get noticed by the state? As a prototype and design solution versus projects imported from developed nation as a form of them knowing more about us. Here I share a project called Rehabilitation of Pakistan Chok. चारों तरफ ये तीनों तरफ एक बनेगा फुटपाथ उस फुटपाथ के हर पांच फीट के बाद एक दरख्त लगेगा हम चाह रहे हैं कि यहाँ पे ये पूरा जो है एक जंगल जैसा हो जाए ठीक है ये इसका हाल ऐसे ही रहेगा नहीं बदलेगा नहीं जैसे अभी हम जो चीज इसमें कर रहे हैं कुछ भी कर लें आप नहीं बदलेगा तो लोग 
एक चौक एक जगह होती है जहाँ पे लोग बैठते हैं नहीं इलाके के हम और आप होते हैं जिसको इस्तेमाल करते हैं तो अभी ये कर रहे हैं कि इसको वापस तो पुराना चौक बनाना चाह रहे हैं कि जब पहले यहाँ पे दरख्त ज़्यादा होते थे छाँव होता था लोग आके बैठते थे बेंचे दो थे इन्होंने तो तोड़ दिए हैं बराबर वालों ने उन्होंने तोड़ दिए अब इनको भी बड़ी सख्ती आ गई है अभी देखो इसमें कितना अच्छा लगा आदमी इस पीपल जब ओनरशिप लेते हैं तो बड़ा फर्क पड़ता है अपने चीज़ का ख्याल रखते हैं This square, after rehabilitation, um, as an architect, usually one does an intervention and steps out. But this space took over its own form and uh, a kind of a space making, where it was inhabited by the artists and the similar activities started taking shape. Here we started a project right after Chalk Rebi rehabilitation of the Old Town Mapping Project, which led to create an archive of the various heritage sites in the urban setting, not looking from a romantic, nostalgic point of view, but more from an activism and monitoring uh, perspective. The visual documentation led to many queries of everyday decay and deterioration. The Spoken History Project was an outcome of the mapping project. We gathered storytellers and extract data to map the vestiges of space that was the space that is now how people live and how people look into heritage. What is heritage of now, the living heritage? We seek to both preserve and activate the members and memorabilia of Old Town by simultaneously archiving and exhibiting it. From here, the linkage is created and how to then talk about this heritage collection of data that we were collecting on everyday basis. Heritage Walk Karachi was born. Heritage Walk Karachi project is the outcome of the two programs mentioned above. The motive of the project is to engage people from all around the city with the area of Old Town and enable them to explore the historical treasures. But this is a different kind of treasure. It was not to promote tourism. It was to talk about decay. And it was talk to talk about through workshops and research tours that who, how we can all get together and talk about the missing past. From here, I'm going to talk briefly again about this uh, project, which is a constant, through constant urban development, giving more area to roads and network. They have affected many historical trees of Karachi. This was my last project before leaving Karachi for my research in London, a project where we conserved and got the area declared as first kind, where the Banyan Tree Preservation Project took place. Almost 60 trees have been rehabilitated and given its due status a structure with holding general, gen, generational history silently, majestically. It was a very basic, a non-architecture intervention, but all we did was to take care of the leaning uh, and showing the processes. From here, I'm going to lead towards vandalism. How do we respect and how do we take care? The term isolate comes from the Italian esselor, from the Latin insula, island, and means to make someone become an island. The overwhelmingly financial time pressures for architects haven't changed much, nor has the chauvinism that women must navigate from the developer's office to the construction site. Sadly, there's little, pers there's little reason to expect the situation to improve soon. But as Parveen Rahman said, I'm an optimist. The maximum I can remain depressed is for 10 minutes. Here I'm showing these images uh, painted on murals as murals on, on a public wall of Yasmin Lari and Parveen Rahman. Both got um, vandalized by, by the outsiders. But here I'm going to end on my last slide, which is carving a new journey to claim. In recent years, of course, women have become more visible and vocal. The constant question of inclusiveness, asking for space, emphasis on collaboration and breakdown of tradition boundaries between different disciplines and space making. This kind of hustle, a project to end on, is called Girls at Dhaba, for its time, ask the right questions. Ask for togetherness, 
demanded for infrastructure for all. You can read more about their work on their website and listen to informal conversations around South Asian politics of placemaking. May the role of us in our region is to voice, to collaborate, to form a collective, to build with, and to think, think with others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mari, for this uh, really interesting journey to uh, your culture and uh, your town. Um, I would like to ask uh, Karim to uh, speak now, but uh, before we do that, just in order to link what we heard now to the con conversation at large, uh, you were showing Marvi uh, a very uh, interesting story about a female architect who was actually uh, dealing with planning infrastructure. And um, I thought it looked like she was very much uh, sensitive towards the needs of the surroundings and the needs of uh, the town and planning uh, from this awareness um, of creating sort of a better place for the society. I would like to ask you, Karin, um, also in your statement to perhaps reflect on um, your opinion about um, the difference of female and male architects. Is there a difference? Um, do you see a, sort of a, an importance in, in, in drawing a line there between the difference of female and male architecture? Um, please. Yes, thank you, Sharon. Um, well, I would um, like to put up some, some questions to our speakers and um, maybe we can, can come further also to the discussion if there's any gendered architecture, because I think it's, this is always uh, the elephant in the room. Um, the question we are, we are also putting up if, uh, if architecture or um, urban planning is gendered or not, would we have the same cities if uh, women were do, doing the planning and all this. But um, I would like uh, firstly um, to um, look on the historical perspective and ask Mary. Um, I'm, I'm re really thinking, for example, Margarete Schütte-Lihotsky, it's, it's enormous uh, what uh, she experienced in her life and what, what her work uh, is really worthy. Uh, I would like to know um, how, Mary, how do you evaluate uh, the careers of uh, the women in uh, history from, from our perspective uh, now? And the question is simple, but a little bit tricky. Um, if uh, they would have been men, how would we call them? Would they, they be some kind of Mies van der Rohe? The question behind is, this is also a little bit, um, what, what about the barriers they had to confront and uh, how severe were these misogynist uh, confrontations they have to deal with to become um, the persons uh, as whom, we're, whom we look at it, uh, at them now. Karen, thank you for the question. And I think there's a lot of questions there. So I'm just going to talk about maybe the first part. Uh, anyway, we can have this conversation for hours, probably. But um, I'm probably the oldest one in the group. And I actually met Shotuli Hutsky on a couple occasions in the 90s. And I actually got to know her a little bit for the first time uh, around 1990, when she was given an honorary doctorate at the Technical University in Berlin. I was teaching there, my professor who I was working for organized it. He was from Vienna, he organized an honorary doctorate for her. And the point was, and she shows up and she's already over 90 years old and everything else. And we couldn't, about your question, how would we consider these people? Is she a female Miss van der Rohe? Or how would we kind of conceive of her at the time? First of all, nobody knew who she was. Now she's this big feminist icon. And then we started looking at all the stuff that she had done over 60 years, 70 years in architecture. 
And of course, at the time, it was the height of postmodernism, where you're supposed to be a star architect, you have an office, and you're in one place, and you make a lot of objects. And she doesn't have that. She's all over the place. She's moving over all the time. She, she's involved with every person you can imagine. She gets involved in a lot of discussions. She's politically active. She produces a lot of paper. That means she produces a lot of ideas. Her stuff isn't always realized. The stuff she creates, I mean, I didn't show everything, but she's building in Bulgaria. She's in the Soviet Union. She does something in Cuba. Um, her stuff really isn't, it's more about the idea of the thing. Uh, she develops types that are then developed further over many years. The point is, she didn't have a career or a body of work that you could easily put in a box and say, this is a star architect. So when we first, I remember I first met her about 30 years ago now, you just couldn't, you know, if Deutsch, she said, man, man kann sie nicht einordnen. There was no box to put her in. Mm. And you were like, well, she's certainly a character. She's been all over the world. She's done a lot, but is this really an architect? I think that was our reaction to her. I think now, 30 years later, and also our point in time where political activism between Me Too, Black Lives Matter, Fridays for Future, we're in a moment in time where politics are becoming very, um, very present and really politics mm -hmm. from the bottom up. I think it's much easier to uh, embrace a figure like her and say, it's not just about objects, it's about all this other engagement that you have in a life. So I think when you look at their careers in, in answer to what you're saying, you have to just think differently about what an architect is and what it can be. And just you mentioned misogyny, and I mentioned that at the beginning of my talk because that was so important. I mean, that's what women had to deal with even until today. But it's very interesting when you get someone like Shutali Hotsky or even Lucy Hillebrand, who is also very uh, successful, when you look at their writings, they never mention misogyny. They never mention, if, if it, it might just be a little thing on the side, but it's like, I was here, I did it, you know, I knew all these people. And it becomes very, very difficult if you've experienced it to really emphasize it. Um, I think it's something that's very internalized on the part of women. And uh, you just want to have the feeling like, I don't want to be treated like this. I don't want to be a victim. So in their own words, you rarely, rarely see it. I think you very often have to read between the lines to try to pick it out. And of course, one, one very obvious thing for me is that Hildebrand and Chateau Hutsky, they do a lot, they're socially active, the whole deal, but they're where they can move around is very limited. They are, they're allowed to move in the domestic sphere and the social sphere. If when they start moving into other areas, then it just doesn't happen. So, um, so that would be kind of an indirect kind of discrimination. Mm. If that starts to answer your question, yeah. Mm. Yes, and that's a, a point we, we are dealing with uh, even today that uh, I found this out also in my research that there are many women today which are saying, uh, uh, I'm not only a female architect, I'm an architect. So I think uh, this, this narrative has gone uh, until today and is still working today. Uh, but uh, the very important question I have about it, uh, about evaluating this uh, historic works of uh, female architecture is how could we teach, teach it today in a, in a good manner, especially uh, just not uh, putting the female architects in the box and to say, oh, we have architecture and then we have female architecture. Because we, are, we have uh, many female students today and we really need uh, also historical role models. So I think it's very important to find an answer for the question, how can we frame female architecture history today to uh, put it uh, in a good view uh, and to serve as role models for our students today? What do you think? Uh, that's a great question, and that's a question that a lot of us are dealing with, and it's very difficult to give a very simple answer. I think, um, but, but I said at the beginning, when I talked about for architect, every situation is different. And so I think one thing is you, you really have to contextualize the situation. If you're a wealthy woman, if your family has certain connections, if they're willing to support you, you might have different, a different 
area of activity, then perhaps if you're struggling or um, if your family, you don't have that much support from your family, or maybe you're politically active, so you're going to have to leave a country or whatever. So I think um, for political reasons, so I think you really have to contextualize women, number one. And number two, women are all over the place. And I think we have to expand just history. And when women are there, we just have to put them in. For example, the, the situation with Hans Polzig and Marlena Polzig, but we all yes. talk about Hans Polzig. Mm -hmm. And one of the funny things with Frau Architect, I saw two examples actually, one was that there was a very famous Hans Polzig exhibition at Dam about 12 years ago now, and there were these very beautiful color drawings that were shown. Well, there's been a lot of research now on Marlena, and we had an expert come in and said, no, those drawings aren't by Hans, they're by Marlena. So we showed them, <laughs> but now, so I mean, it's sometimes you just have to add, well, you just have to add her name. But I mean, yeah. it, I mean, mm. they were there. And then the other example is Charlotte Cohen, because Dam has a very wonderful, MAPA, it's a portfolio of the work of Richard Kaufman, the, the, the architect from Frankfurt Mine, who then goes to the ma Mandatory Palestine. He's a very important architect there. And Dan paid a lot of money for this beautiful collection of his early designs for garden cities. But uh, Lada Cohen very nicely signed her name on some of the drawings. So we went to the Richard Kaufman MAPA portfolio, and the drawings that had Charlotte Cohen written on them, we also hung them on the wall. So on one hand, they're there, you know, they've just been pushed out of the story. So it's a, what you're asking is really a very complicated question, but there are yeah. times when they are mm -hmm. just there. Those are just two examples. And we just have to put them in and then expand the notion of what is an architect. It's not the single genius, it's someone working yes. collectively. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean if it's from this design point of view, or what Marvie was saying, how you're working with a group of people collectively to make spaces and not just build it, but then what mm -hmm. happens in the space. So I think there's this whole notion of how space is made, who makes it, and then what happens to it. Yes. But I think maybe we should also reflect to uh, and ask ourselves if it's a cultural thing. No, I, I, I think that every culture sort of treats um, this gender uh, issue a bit different. Um, and I don't know if, uh, if we can compare it like that. I'm sure Marvi has different experience than perhaps uh, Sigal can share with us. And perhaps it's also interesting to uh, look at, uh, at this question of gender in a broader perspective, in a social cultural perspective, uh, rather than just uh, the gender one. What do you think, Marvi? Do you think there is a, is, is a cultural thing that you see, like if you compare it to to London, or is it like a time gap, or what? What? What do you feel? I mean, I absolutely agree with with like how like Mary put it. Like it's a it's a case to case study. It is uh, for the type of like, um, where are we looking and how are we looking? Like, for instance, Yasmi Nari, if you speak to her, like I've been like in interview with her and she keeps on emphasizing that she was lucky to get all these major large projects um, in her time when she came back from London to, to Karachi to practice. And uh, and you never hear about the message honest kind, kind, like, like, kind of like layered where like, you know, people or men are creating some kind of barriers she never talks about those, but in between lines where she'll say that I retired because now I saw a change. I saw how the contractors were taking over. I saw how the built environment was more about third parties. It was no more about what architect is producing. It's more about like how different sects are coming together and making this, this uh, project management rather than a design. So you, you hear in between these things. And then with, with the Parveen's um, case study, she um, talks a lot about the bureaucracy. She talks about how government created hurdles. So, so these are some narratives that you hear and then you, then you get to understand that um, everyone went through a certain struggle. Some speak about it and some talk through the case through, uh, through a project. So it's, it's, I think it's more than culture. It's more about like a certain uh, episode that takes place. Do you think your, your role as a, as a female architect in Pakistan is also influenced uh, by the Western oriented um, genius um, culture? Is it, um, is a, um, 
Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, we were like, when we, we were doing undergrad and we were studying, we were given a lot of precedence studies from international, but then um, there was a lot of emphasis on, on regionality. I mean, it also depends on what college you go to. And my particular college emphasized on a lot of like local methodologies. And I was very lucky that right after college, I never, I, I, I ended up working with Heritage Foundation, which, which Yasmi Lari headed. And she um, was like the overarching perspective where she showed how to work in the rural. By that time, Yasmi Lari had retired from her main practice. And now she was practicing more in the rural setting. So I got exposed to that. And that really helped me in, in nurturing, into looking into cities in a more collaborative way, rather than from a design studio perspective, where it's more about client and architect relationship rather than the city or holistic perspective. So I think um, here I would really owe to, to, to Mrs. Lari's uh, perspective. Uh, it, it, really, it really reflected and it really made uh, an overarching um, reflection on my practice. But at the same time, I would say that um, it is difficult. I mean, especially in the context in South Asia, um, we are constantly struggling with, with a bureaucratic behavior. And that, that creates um, automatically into this gender position where um, men are then considered as, as the engineers or the, or, the, or the authority. And the women uh, are considered more from a beautification and interior perspective. So that's kind of like, like boxing it and putting into a, a certain uh, notion. So you were talking about the heritage of now, which I found was a very interesting phrase to put it. Um, and you're also talking about this sort of, uh, or showing at least a sort of vernacular uh, architecture that um, is present uh, still in your city. Um, do you really think that you have to uh, conserve all those buildings just as they were, or would you rather have this sort of uh, live archive um, and this sort of uh, very intense um, public notion about the history of those buildings? Like, how important for you is the physical manifestation of this heritage? I mean, Karachi is going through a major identity crisis right now in terms of like what, A, there is no um, a holistic master plan. That's the first category of a problem. The second one is um, a contradictory heritage bylaw, which has not been renewed uh, since 1994. Things have changed a lot in the city. And, um, and because of that law, it has given a very superficial perspective towards conserving and, and, and preserving heritage. What uh, the law, the clause says that you can only keep the skin. So somewhere, I mean, this is part of my um, architectural uh, perspective politics that I keep on emphasizing with the government that if that's the case, then you will lose out on major uh, typologies. So if there is one typology where the courtyard or the um, internality of the gut of the building is important, then you need to make categories and say, these are the important ones, these are less important ones, and these, are, um, these can be changed and altered with uh, time. But the problem is because of that bylaw, all the skin are started, like they've started taking care of just the facade. And I, and I think that needs a huge critique. So, so when I say heritage of now, it means of category, it means of, um, it means of how the people are using that space. Every building doesn't need a modern uh, intervention or adaptive reuse. Every, every building of heritage doesn't need to be seen from a, a museum perspective. Um, it needs to be, I mean, that's what house in South Asia, a heritage, if you, if you restore means something that you need to bring a new pro program into it. So, so there are lots of like a, like a huge debate over that. Yes, I think we're facing the same thing in our city as well, because there is a lot of development pressure on one hand. And, uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, we want to uh, conserve this historical heart. But, um, you know, there's also systems that are different than uh, they used to be. And uh, building sometimes needs to adapt. The question is also, of course, economical then. I mean, it's much cheaper to just destroy the building and build a new one. And if this is the need of society, what can you say? You know, it's like uh, 
all those uh, big, big issues that I think um, uh, are related also to our topic today in terms of um, what does it mean to do conservation? Um, I mean, the, the biggest uh, problem that took place in, in, the, in the 90s back in Karachi was that um, with, with a complete without bottom, bottom up approach, 350 buildings were declared heritage. And out of that, there was no, again, no categorization of uh, which is of the highest importance, which one is the mid important like that. And what it did was it created a lot of insecurity within people diastra. And they started saying that why is our building heritage when it just has like, you know, a quality which is not, which can't stand through. So um, that kind of like overarching uh, power on declaring heritage itself is something that needs to be deconstructed and talked about. That um, how can we include people in, in becoming that part of that heritage conversation? Yes, that's, I, I agree with you. This is perhaps the most important part to bring the notion uh, or just sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, people to feel proud about their own heritage and see it as their own narrative, I think is really um, a very important question is a lot of time also connected to the story you tell uh, and not only to the physical manifest, but Sigal, you were talking to me about this uh, uh, state of uh, neglect uh, those buildings sometimes uh, are in and also the big amount of demolishment. How do you see it? Yeah, so uh, for example, um, by 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 uh, El Vigidoni Mandelstam, there are so so few buildings in Tel Aviv that uh, that I feel that we have to keep it. It's it's not just important to uh, to research on these architects or to, uh, to 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 put them back into historiography. It it is also important to to keep and to preserve the buildings. I mean, uh, uh, most of them, even not in the uh, preservation list. So it, it maybe at, at those days when they prepared the, the plans, uh, they didn't know about the importance of these architects. But now that we know, and uh, uh, we have to, to think how we how we manage to, to put, to, to keep them and, and not to, uh, to say sorry, we we did a mistake. We can't change it now. Uh, I, I don't have the solution. I'm I'm just a re I, I'm a researcher, and this is something that has to be uh, done together with the with the municipality to see uh, how can we preserve those buildings which are not in the preservation list, and 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 they are important because these women were important, and they uh, are impo they important in uh, for our heritage. Uh, if if you look and at, at this period, and this was uh, this is a well researched period of, of mandatory Palestine, the White City, and uh, as you said, the uh, all the architects who came in uh, the fifth uh, uh, wave of Aliyah. Um, so in 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 the research, there's so many articles and books on on men architects, but only very very few mention women. So they're not part of our heritage, and now that the research was done, we have to to include them uh, also in the preservation uh, plan of, of Tel Aviv. I have one question because you're touching on very very uh, different, but you also touch about the question: Why do we preserve a building? Is it the quality of the building? Is it the architect? behind the building. I mean, what we're talking about in the, in the Tel Aviv example is we have, if I understood this correctly, is yes, we should preserve the buildings because the architects were important. How do we deal actually today with uh, how, what kind of buildings do we preserve? We have examples here in Frankfurt, let's say the library by um, Ferdinand Kramer, the university library. I'm not sure is it the quality of the building which is preserved or is it because it's done by that architect and during the 1960s and Frankfurt has already destroyed a lot of buildings from the 1960s? Is, is there something where we can say, um, how, is it, how is it with the first architects, female architects in Germany? I mean, how do we deal with preserving buildings 
shall we preserve a building just because it was done by Zaha Hadid or preserve a building because it was just done by Frank O'Geary or how do we do it looking in the future to current architects? Will that un help us answering how do we deal with already um, uh, f from buildings from the modern times? What do you think? I, I, I think it's a combination of, of of issues. I mean, uh, at, the, at the case of, of Guidoni, she she has only uh, uh, two apartment building in Tel Aviv left. Mm. She was a very important architect. She she is also very important in the states, and uh, we need to 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 have at least uh, this these examples for for our heritage. We cannot just uh, erase and uh, the, the, her work in Tel Aviv. I mean, it's not important to have her only in the uh, 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 in the research books. It's also important to walk in the city and say, "Oh, this is a building by a woman architect." There were women architects at those days. It's 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 important for 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 students for for the public to know that uh, there was there were women architects, and this is a, a really a, a, a special phenomenon at that time in in, in Palestine. Uh, there was no gender equality in all aspects of life, but in architecture, the women got uh, a great opportunity to 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 be involved in the uh, in the building of, of the society and building the um, the cities. Uh, mainly because there was such a boom construction and there was so much work for for everyone. So uh, men men didn't think that they they, they take their work. So, but, uh, Sigal, was there also really a, a definition of um, a feminine uh, role in architecture these days? I mean, a lot of those women did uh, social housing and like um, community housing. And no, I, I feel that a lot of time when I see the, the research work you have done, there is sort of a quality uh, that one can put uh, its hand on. No, or am I mistaken? No, it's it's uh, you're definitely right. Uh, three women architects, Lotte Cohen and uh, Elsa Guidoni and Jenny Averbu, uh, collaborated with the uh, with the Zionist women's organization. They uh, they won competitions. They were invited by these organizations to um, to design to build an, a new institutions, and this is also one of a kind. It's it, there was no uh, such institutions before in Palestine. They had to uh, to think about a new program, new um, uh, idea how uh, we, the modern woman should uh, 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 live in in this in these institutions, like uh, uh, the women pioneers' houses in Jerusalem, in Atania, in, in Tel Aviv, and in Haifa. And three of them were, were designed by women architects. This is something new, and 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 we have to at least the one in Tel Aviv, uh, which is, is 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 very neglected. But because they didn't have uh, money, they didn't change anything. So if if uh, someone wants to preserve it, it, it it's all there. It it has just to to clean it and 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 to preserve it. And, and this is a wonderful example of how the Jewish society, how uh, women organizations, Zionist women's organization, how uh, uh, female architects collaborate together to build uh, something new, a new institution, new way of living, a modern living for a modern wo uh, woman. It's not just the building and if, it, if we like the, the architecture or not, it's, it's ideology. So you're saying women were planning for women? But I want to ask actually Karen, because um, you talked about the big elephant in the room. And I wonder, I mean, today, of course, it's a different sort of uh, situation. No, I mean, there are a lot more women in the profession, not as much as me, we maybe want to as architects, female architects, but still there, there's a lot more recognition about female architecture. And I wonder if by saying that there is a difference between female and male architecture, if we're not like, you know, feeding this sort of uh, maybe approach that um, there is a sort of a, a gap between men and women. I mean, 
it's kind of counterproductive to sort of um, talk uh, so much about feminine architect versus uh, male architect and then to try and say that um, female and male architect uh, is, uh, should, should be the same. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, I understand you very well. Um, yes, it, that's always a question and it's all uh, of, of discrimination or fem female discrimination that uh, there is um, the question if you're reprodu re reproducing stereotypes by it. But um, I think the point is, well, I'm, I'm always saying um, if, if a woman would plan the cities uh, from, uh, from today on, cities would look different and we, do, we don't know how, but I would be interested in how they would look like then, because I'm sure they would uh, look different because women have uh, very many uh, life experiences and life realities men don't have. So um, it was, would be interesting what would happen if we had a parent parity in decisions about planning and in the planning culture. And um, I'm, I'm sure it would it would be be different because um, as uh, as we see we've seen in history, uh, female approaches have have been different, and we ca cannot um, count it down uh, only on, on on quality. That say oh we're looking only only on quality. We're not interested in in the gender. I think uh, we should um, have everybody. Uh, to have a seat at the table and then we will see what will happen. But I'm seeing there's a, a question from the audience. Aaron, maybe we can... Yes, I, I also on. want to uh, please Ran or Markus, but Ran, you're here and with oh. us. We need to get a male perspective here. So can you <laughs> tell us what you think? Exactly. I'm, I feel I, uh, I'm here uh, representing the minority. Um, anyway, How does it feel I, for I you being a, being a minority for once? <laughs> At least I'm a minority gender-wise on the screen. It's um, marvelous, isn't it? Great. Maybe you, you, mark, did you find your feminine quality in this talk already? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, um, I have one small remark. Uh, uh, coming from what you said, uh, Sharon, and what we, we have seen is that at least on uh, demolition, women are not discriminated. Women, uh, female architects are not discriminated. So buildings are being demolished, wh uh, whether they are designed by female or uh, male architects. And uh, that's, a, that's a, at least on that, there is no discrimination or uh, favorites. And that uh, should worry us, not because of the discrimination, but because of their being demolished. And you've shown uh, beautiful uh, examples of building that uh, might not be there for a long time. And my question is uh, for Marie and for Sigal. We know that history is uh, written by the victorious. And I think that also hist uh, history of modern architecture was written by men, as, as long as I know, as long as I read. And so, first of all, uh, do you agree and with that, that, and how did it influence your research? So probably it was harder to, to, to find materials written on those architects by men. Um, uh, how, how did it did it affect your work? Can I, can I go? Yeah, please. Um, well, yeah, I just thank you so much for the question, because I think that's, um, you know, I'm, I, I look forward to what Seagal has to say, and I know Seagal's work, so I can I have a feeling of what she'll probably say, but um, when you look at Germany, um, first of all, you know, who wrote about the history? Well, um, sometimes you have to look at atypical sources just to find materials, et cetera, et cetera. But going back to this discussion that we had just now about is there a feminine architecture, masculine architecture, do women design differently? 
that whole direction. Well, there were certain times historically in the 20th century where women said they justified that women design differently than men to uh, justify the fact that we need women architects, we need a feminine contribution to architecture. And this was very much the argumentation before 1914. You'll have a lot of women rights advocates who are making these arguments. And then women architects, like the ones that I showed, they agreed with that and they would then argue or they would produce architecture that could be interpreted as kind of an answer to a feminine contribution to the public sphere because the, the public sphere is filled with masculine ideas, that's technology, rationality. The women can bring this organic nurturing side. And if I make an architecture that expresses it, then the public sphere will be balanced. We'll have what the men do, we have what the women do, and then the masculine, the public sphere will be whole. And you don't necessarily find that in architectural treatises, but when you look at the intellectual history of the women in the first women's movement or what they're writing, particularly in Germany, this comes out very clearly. And these women align themselves with it. And then you have the same, uh, this exact same situation in West Germany in the 70s and the 80s with the second women's movement. There's a criticism on the man-made world with men written big. When women design the world, we're going to um, care for processes sort of like families, children, how they, how they use cities, etc. Our urban planning, our, our housing has to be more responsive to women, children, families, and their needs. This is a women's answer to the, the world at large. It's different than what the men do. And, and so they very consciously argued in that way. And the point is what you said, which I thought was so exciting was that there's a whole, there are tons of texts about this. There are buildings that have been built, there are projects that have been realized. But when we look at architectural theory, that's never discussed. So, I mean, there's this whole line of, of, let's call it feminist criticism of the built environment that starts around 1900, if not before, goes up to the present day. I can tell you the examples from Germany, but you will never find it in a history book. So it's not like it's not there, but it's just, you know, it's just overlooked. So if that's a, a contribution to what you're saying. So we're not only talking about Arch female architects, we're also talking about female architectural historians or critics, yes. And also theory. I mean, people are producing theories and then, you know. Markus, did you also want to say something? I think it's always important to um, work in mixed teams. Um, I think um, it's um, always better um, to have um, different um, backgrounds in, in, uh, in, in teams and um, to work together. And um, I think um, if we look in, in different um, cities, um, the last decades uh, were dominated by, by men. The planning of cities were dominated by men. And I think um, also um, the, the car dominated city, for example, um, this is um, a, a very good example for a um, man dominated um, planning um, um, phase, phase um, in urban planning, because I think um, this period um, was um, dominated by the men who go to work and the, the women were more um, um, for the families. And so today um, we work in, in another situation and we have other um, possibilities. And I think it's better to work in, in mixed team to different opinions and different backgrounds in um, planning. So do you actually do that in Frankfurt? Do you have sort of a mixed uh, decision making or is it actually something that you do? Like I, I'm just, you know, from Israel, sometimes I hear people speaking to me in Germany and they say uh, Studentin, Studentinnen, like it's, it's becoming very trendy now, I find in Germany at least to sort of add uh, the, the feminine side to, um, uh, to the talk and also to decision making, is it already really happening in in, uh, in your municipality, for example? So we um, we try to have mixed teams. So, for example, if we um, have to um, decide who who gets a new um, head of um, urban planning or head of um, um, uh, heritage, um, we always have um, the um, situation that we 
would like to organize it that 50% of the new positions would like to um, would, would, um, manage by women and 50% um, by men. But um, today we have um, 70 to 30% of 70s are men, 70% are men and 30% are women. So um, if, you have, if you have new positions, more women should um, get these positions that we have a 50-50 situation in, uh, in the future. So it's important. It's also part, part of our um, contracts we um, discuss um, for the municipality, so the political contracts. Okay, interesting. I think we have a lot to learn uh, from uh, what you're doing uh, here. Um, are there any uh, further comments you want to say, Karin, because you are starting, I think, uh, to touch upon uh, issues uh, of your work. And uh, I would like to ask you, perhaps, with your experience on um, researching this uh, gender topic today, um, maybe um, continue uh, with statement according to what we heard. Yes, I think I think overlooking uh, our, our speeches today, um, uh, the the problem or the the misogynist uh, problems uh, that Mary uh, put on, firstly, uh, are still working today and are still uh, manifested in our professional culture and in our, our teaching culture until today. Because we have, uh, I think, we have very strong. A narratives and uh, a very strong, at least in Germany, this Bau, Baumeister uh, culture. Uh, we, but I think it's also an, an international point. And I've, I think we have also seen this today that it's, um, it's part of the professional culture of, of architecture with, with is always connected uh, with, uh, with genius, with a lonely genius who is uh, doing a great work, and this is um, influencing our works uh, until today. So, short comment. But I've seen uh, there's another question from the audience, from Inbal. Yes, Inbal, you're muted. Yes, please. Yeah, I took it off. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have a question for all um, of our speakers tonight. Um, as some of you know, um, last month, uh, Kathleen James Chakraborty uh, received uh, the very prestigious ERC grant um, to research uh, women, race, and the dissemination of modern architecture. And I think it's uh, important for, for all our community, not just academia. Um, it, it, it really, you know, shines a light on the importance of um, of promoting this research um, that you presented today of uh, women's contribution to architecture. And from what I understand, one of the um, uh, main points of this proposal is to push further beyond architects that have already been researched. And, you know, we've discussed some uh, uh, better known and lesser known examples. So I was wondering if you could brief um, tell us uh, what, how, how you're planning, if you are planning to, to expand your research into lesser known women architects or maybe um, uh, periods or, um, or, or dissemination in other places that, that have not yet been, uh, been researched. Yes. Yeah. I would, uh, I wish I knew Arabic, so I would like to research on the uh, first Palestinian uh, women architect. I have no idea when uh, Palestinian women started to uh, practice in architecture in free state Israel, in Palestine, or after the establishment of the state of Israel in the West Bank. Um, I think try to, uh, to, to find out with other research, uh, researchers who, are, uh, who, who research uh, on, on, on topics of, of the Palestinian society, but uh, uh, until now I couldn't find any. So I, I, uh, I call now to, to those who would like to collaborate in, in researching on uh, 
uh, Palestinian women architects. Um, I think this is a very important also for, for our uh, understanding this um, uh, specific situation in Israel. Hey Mary, you also want to add to our discussion? Yeah, um, I'm, a, I'm, as I said before, I'm like one of the oldest ones here. So I know the first generations of people who are writing about women architects when these first histories came out in the 70s and the 80s. And we took them all very seriously and everything was wonderful. And I'm looking, I'm interested right now at looking back at this work from the 70s and the 80s from the United States and also from West Germany and looking at what was left out or what was consciously kept out of these narratives. Um, so we always think that when we build feminist work, it's the foundation is good and every step is going to get better and better. And um, for example, one of the texts that was made in the United States in the late seventies, it focuses on really wealthy upper-class white women there's no mention of race um, or the immigrants that were coming into the United States and how what they might have brought to architectural culture. So my focus is not so much on new areas, but looking at what we've already done and looking at them critically. And then from what I know a little bit, the United States and then also Germany. Um, so I'm looking at the foundations of the house to, to see how strong they are, to use a metaphor. <laughs> Yes, so thank you, uh, Mary. Um, I also want to state something that uh, is happening here in uh, Israel, which I think is very good. Uh, we are doing uh, Jane's walks. There's a, you know, a writer called Jane Jacobs, you all know her. And I think you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to research and to write uh, about things, but it's, yeah, the, the, the other thing is to experience it and I think through the, the Jane walks we're doing where we invite people to come and join us and explore the city through their own eyes and then reflect upon theories. Uh, this is something that I think uh, uh, we should take into consideration. And I also invite us conservation architects to maybe rethink about how we do conservation and uh, how we tell the stories uh, in order to not only take care about a detail of a window or a specific uh, appearance that we think uh, was right at the time it was built according to a photograph. But really, how do we commemorate those stories for the future generations um, in a way that they are relevant to them and um, not only, um, you know, relevant to our eyes because also you know, like you do an archive, sometimes in an archive, you have to decide what to keep and what to uh, leave out. And maybe it's relevant to your decision right now, but perhaps in a generation later, a different uh, sort of, um, you know, um, uh, artifact is important. So um, I, I, I ask us to, to see how we uh, tell the stories and, and how we make them uh, feasible um, and perhaps also use other mediums um, than only writing and only maybe conserving the physical manifest. I'm guiding a Jane walk tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you guide a Jane walk? Maybe tell us about that. Well, um, my, my walk tomorrow is um, the uh, rather brutalist uh, architecture campus of the Ben Gurion University, which we will talk about uh, probably in one of our next uh, evenings. Um, and uh, well, I, I connect, you know, uh, people to to buildings and and also to historical context because they're usually um, very interested in those contexts. And actually, our discussion here has made me think that um, specifically the walk that I'm guiding has a lot of really, really significant um, effect, we, women architects. And um, I think it might just, you know, bring me to, to emphasize it more because for me, it's, it's a given, you know, I, I look at it as such a natural thing. And especially when I talk about the six, 1960s and 1970s, and I think it's probably good that people, um, people look at it as something which is a given and, you know, they're, they're not surprised or anything, but uh, might be worthwhile to emphasize that this is not, did not just happen, you know, and it was after a very um, 
long and laborious uh, process. And again, the nice thing about the Jane Walks is that uh, I think it really does connect people to architecture. And a lot of times I hear people saying afterwards, listen, you've made me, not necessarily me, but the guides they, that they that you, you've made us look differently at, at architecture and look up at the details and uh, you know like some of the things that uh, we saw in Marvi's uh, video mm -hmm. early that you know for us might be a little bit clear but people but uh, it's it's really nice to to mediate it you know to to people and get them closer to architecture. I just wanted to add here that um... I'm so sorry, I just saw the message where it said that the screen was mm. not fit to the scale and you couldn't see the, the presentation. But um, the idea of the video was also to show that um, the intervention was also from this term that we used was Mohalla Bazi, which is like taking the neighborhood in consideration at every step of what we were doing. So, so that, 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 that architect who's talking to the people, he's actually asking for recommendations while things were being implemented. And this is something that when we compare it to other public projects, when either um, large architectural offices, when they implement, they look at from a very gentrified, um, clearing, cleaning, and sanitizing the area. May our, this project, I mean, right now, if you go and see it, it, it won't be one of the most polished spaces, but there's a sense of ownership that took place. The process became a really important factor. And going back to Heritage Walk, um, here, uh, the walk itself, I mean, we're not, we're not adding any, um, like not taking philosophies of Jane Jacob and, and talking through that. But what, what's happening is that when we take them into these smaller pockets, we ask the people to narrate their history rather than the guide mm -hmm. speaking for them. The people speak about their project, their, their house they're living in. So maybe the house is not like, you know, the, they, they, they're the third generation living in that house and they don't have direct history of that house. But what's interesting is that they have these secret corners that they have kind of like figured and searched. They share that. And they also talk about the, the dent, the, 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 the porous side of it, which is the fractured side of it. That, you know, we are not happy or we are happy living in this building or what's happening with the future. So the insecurity, speaking of the insecurities is very important to, to understand the, the built environment, I feel. And that coming from the grassroots level is, is, a, is a point of a pause, which, which we need to, which metropolitan cities need that right now, that pause and that, that space of, of reflection. So I think these walks can be are a very radical way of looking at, and, and doing a grassroots research. Well, thank you, Mavi, for this wonderful uh, statement. I think it's, uh, it's also very relevant to what we're trying to do here to create some sort of a ownership or um, an awareness uh, uh, and, and, and not you know, feed somebody um, knowledge that we think they should have, but rather to make them experience it and through their experience to have some sort of a feeling even towards uh, their own heritage and through that maybe to connect to their own identity. And of course, if we're talking about gender, it has a, a very important role as well um, in society. So um, I, uh, for me, um, I think this uh, was an amazing talk and uh, we touched upon so many issues that uh, are connected yet uh, far away, but uh, make this decision so uh, multidisciplinary and uh, uh, so deep. So thank you for all the participants uh, um, contributing to this uh, con conversation. Um, maybe Andrea, you want to add? I add the closing words. Uh, I really wish we could all meet in one place, look at the city, walk through it, and share all our different knowledges. I'm impressed by Marvi's, uh, Sigal's, Mary's, Karen's input, and in, in and all the others as well. It's always so interesting, and I would love to just take a walk through Frankfurt with you, and. Um, and get your input and how we can improve the city together with all our different viewpoints from all our different perspectives. So thank you for this really, again, really interesting discussion. And um, I wish we would have more time. 
And I'm remaining optimistic that at one point we will have a live event here in Frankfurt. And I hope this will happen before the end of this year. Uh, things are looking up a bit, I would say, here in Germany. I would like to announce our next talk because we have two more scheduled online. That is the next is Thursday, 10th of June from roof wall to rooftop facilities. So the question of how do we use roof areas, all the different types which were used in modern times, which uh, would be appropriate today, ranging from roof terraces, adding floors and all this. Um, we will discuss on 10th of June and then on the 8th of July, we have the evolution of modernism and its perception in society today, where Inbal will be one of the speakers and we will talk about how the modern architecture developed until today. So brutalism will be one of the topics to be touched upon. And um, we do look forward already to this. And uh, then hopefully we will gather again and organize a live event. So thank you very much to everybody participating, to everybody listening. Um, it has been a pleasure to have these international cross-cultural, cross-country discussions. And I, I really love the online format for this because we can continue this over such a long time and always touch on different topics in more depth than we could do in one symposium. Thank you very much. And I say goodbye from Frankfurt to all over the world. Thank you. And see you back on 10th of June, hopefully. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.